السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ٹوڈے وی آر سیلیبریٹنگ اے مسلم آؤٹ ڈے اینڈ وی آر ہیئر ٹوڈے سو وی ول اسٹارٹ آور بگین آور پروگرام ود دا ریسیٹیشن آف خلی قرآن آئی ایم ریکویسٹنگ موسا چودھری صاحب ٹو کم اینڈ ریسائٹ سم پورشن آف خلی قرآن He is Muabin Qaid, Wasiyat of Majlis-e Khudam al-Ahmadiyya, uh, Los Angeles. So, Musa Chaudhary. السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ومن اظلم ممن افترا علم اللہ Zakallah Musa Chaudhary Sahib, one thing I forgot to mention, he is a Hafiz of Quran also. Now I am requesting Samil Malik Sahib to uh, read the translation of these verses. Uh, currently he is serving as a Naib Qaid, Majlis-e Khudam al Los Angeles. Samil Malik Sahib. The following is the English translation of the verses just recited from Surah Al-Saf, chapter 61, verses 8 through 
But who could do greater wrong than one who forges the lie against Allah while he is called to Islam? Allah guides not the wrongdoing people. They desire to extinguish the light of Allah with the breath of their mouths. But Allah will perfect his light, even if the disbelievers hate it. He is who has sent his messenger with the guidance and the religion of truth that he may cause it to prevail over all religions, even if those who associate partners with God hate it. Zagla. Zagla. Now we are going to present a poem written by Hazrat Muslim Mahmud It is uh, addressing towards the youth of the of our Jamaat and it is Nune Halane Jamaat. So so that would be recited by Dr. Furkan Ahmed Sahib, who is currently serving as Nazim Tarbiyat Majlis Khudamul Ahmadiyya uh, Los Angeles. Assalamu alaikum rahmatullah. Hazrat Musleh Maud Razi Allah Ta'ala and Hoke Pakiza Manzum Kalam is a Chand Ashar Peshakidmathe. No nehala ne jamat mujhe kuch kehe na hai. No nehala ne jamaat mujhe kuch kehe na hai Par hai ye shart ke zaae mera pegham na ho पर है ये शर्त के जाए मेरा पैगाम ना हो चाहता हूँ के करूँ चंद नसाए तुम Chahata hu ke karu chand nasaye tum ko ta ke phir baad me mujh par koi ilzam na ho जब गुजर जाएंगे हम तुम पे पड़ेगा सब बार जब गुजर जाएंगे हम तुम पे Padega Aram na ho Khidmat e deen ko ik Fazl e ilahi jano خدمت دین کو ایک فضل الہی جانو 
इसके बदले में कभी तालिब इन आम ना हो दिल में हो सो तो आंखों से रवा हो दिल में हो सो तो आंखों से रवा हो तुम में इस्लाम का हो मज फकत नाम ना हो तुम में इस्लाम का हो मज फकत नाम ना हो रगबत दिल से हो पाबंद नमाजो रोजा रगबत दिल से हो पाबंद नमाजो नजर अंदाज कोई हिस्सा आह काम न हो पास हो माल तो दो इस से जका तो सद का पास हो माल तो दो इस से जका तो सद का फिक्र मिस की रहे तुम को गमे अयाम न हो फिक्र मिस की रहे तुम को गमे अयाम न हो मेरी तो हक में तुम्हारे ये दुआ है प्यारो मेरी तो हक में तुम्हारे ये दुआ है प्यारो सर पे अल्लाह का साया रहे ना काम ना हो मेरी तो हक में तुम्हारे ये दुआ है प्यारो सर पे अल्लाह का साया रहे ना काम ना हो नो ने हाला जमात मुझे कुछ कहना है पर है ये शर्त के जाए मेरा पैगाम ना हो जजाकल्ला फरकान साहेब
now I want to invite uh, Kamran Mubashir Sahib to read the translation of this couplet. Um, currently, he is uh, serving as Nazim Atpal of uh, Masjid of Damal Ahmadiyya, Los Angeles, as well as uh, Halka Tirbiyat Secretary for uh, Baitul Hamid Halka. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. <clears throat> to the nation's youth, Urdu poem of his Hazrat Mirza Bashiruddin Mahmood Ahmed, the head of the Amdiya Muslim community, addressed to the youth, to the young students at Qadiyan, India, rendered into English verse by Dr. Mufti Muhammad Sadiq Azdalano and Madam Rahmatullah Ella May Garber. O ye tender plants of the nation, to you, I have something to say, providing my message may flash not away. Advice I would give to the nation's youth that they may not say, I withheld the truth. When we pass away the burdens of life, you will have to bear. So be not seekers of idle rest, but do and dare, serve the faith with the heart, filled with God's sweet grace. And let not a thought of compensation cloud your face. Let your eyes fill with tears and your heart burn with love. Let your spirit ascend beyond Islam's mere name to the realms above. With full attention continue, offering prayers and keeping fast, obeying God's commandments, which were written in the past. If you have wealth, be charitable in giving alms to those who need. Fear not the days of trouble. If the needy you would feed, my prayer for your sake, O oh dear ones, is this. May God keep you under his shade, bringing no failure but bliss. May you be safe from the darkness of grief, pain, and sorrow. And may the evening shade near cast its shadow. Or your, your sunlight of the morrow. O ye tender plants of the nation, to you I have something to say. Providing my message may flash not away. Jazakumullah. Auzubillahi minash shaitanir rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. I'm so happy to see all of you, mashallah, here this morning. Jazakallah for coming. I believe we have some folks at home on uh, Zoom as well. But uh, it's a very uh, special occasion when you come to the mosque and participate in events like this. So Jazakallah for all those may, uh, who are here and made an effort. As you know, we are celebrating the day of, uh, or commemorating the day of the Hazrat uh, uh, Muslim Audr Zillat Anhu. Um, in this past uh, khutbah, Hazrat Sahib um, reminded us one thing, and I'd like to remind that to everyone as well, especially our uh, younger generation, that why are we celebrating Muslim Out Day? So I'm just going to read exact words that Hazur used. Hazur said that he would answer the question for children and others that if we do not celebrate birthdays, then why do we celebrate the birthday of the Muslim Audazilatalanhu? In this regard, it should be clear that we do not celebrate the birthday of Mirza Bishuruddin Mahmud Ahmad, Razilatalanhu. Rather, we celebrate the fulfillment of the prophecy made regarding the promised reformer. The second Khalifa Razilatalanhu was actually born on 12th January 1889. Hazur further stated that at home, parents should explain to their children the greatness of this prophecy. 
So when you go home, all the younger children that I'm requesting, talk to your parents and ask them to go in detail and explain you further what you have learned today from these speeches, the programs, because all those folks who are going to be presenting things to you, Alhamdulillah, they have done a wonderful job preparing it. So it is a great opportunity to sit down at dinner table and discuss tonight, inshallah. Next, I will share some historic information about the prophecy of Hazrat Muslim When Hazrat Prophet Muhammad published his masterpiece book, Brahina Hamadiyya, and that book caused a lot of uh, problem. Uh, people got angry at him and they really uh, start, uh, you know, huge reper repercussions against him. And those was done by mostly people who were against Islam, but there were some people who were even Muslims, they were against it as well. So after he wrote this book, um, he decided to go to a city in India called Hoshiarpur. And he decided that he's going to do itikaf or uh, 40 days of uh, chilla, or he's going to basically literally lock himself up in this room and he's going to pray to Allah Ta'ala that may Allah Ta'ala help him for the success of Islam. So during these 40 days, Prophet Muhammad Salaam received a great deal of direct communication from Allah Ta'ala. And on February 20th, 1886, he published a leaflet in which he stated that God Almighty had informed him during the period of solitude that a child would be born to him. He would assist greatly in the service of Islam. The Prophet Muhammad Salaam wrote this prophecy on the 20th February, as I stated. And that is the day a few days ago, February 20th, 1886. And it was published in a newspaper called Riyaz e Hind. And this was published in that newspaper on March 1st, 1886, as a supplement to the newspaper, but it was not printed on a green paper. A lot of folks think that, that uh, the prophecy was published on a green paper, on a uh, subhajish they are. That's not the case. You may see a lot of green in this room, I'm even wearing a shirt green, but that does not mean that it was published on this particular uh, color. And I'm going to explain what the background of the subzish or the green leaflet is as well. So when Hazur published that uh, uh, prophecy in the riyaz e um, people also said something against that prophecy as well. And uh, what happened afterward was that instead of the son, the first child was born after the prophecy was a daughter. Her name was Ismat. She was born on 15th April, 1886. Ignorant people ridiculed at it. Later on, a son was born on 7th August, 1887, but he died on 4th November, 1888. At the death of this son, once again, the opponent raised a lot of hue and cry. They strongly challenged the truth of this prophecy and rejected it altogether. At this point, Prophet Muhammad Islam wrote a small leaflet on 1st December 1888. It was entitled Hakani Takrir Babakai Wafate Bashir. That the information or the, uh, the godly uh, information about the death of the Bashir -e Awal. In this, he explained the true meaning of the prophecy and declared very emphatic, emphatically that come what may, the promised son is going to be born within the stipulated period of nine years from the date of this first announcement of the prophecy, which is February 20th, 1886. This leaflet was published on a green color and that was called Sabz Ishtihar. Now, Hazrat Muslim uh, uh, Maud who did not even claim that he was a Muslim Maud until 1944. There were several jalsas, several gatherings were organized. Uh, I believe Delhi, Lahore, Hosharpur, just to name a few. I believe there were five of them. So Hazur Razi uh, Talan who traveled to Hosharpur and he chose the location next to the house where Prophet Musa Islam spent 40 days in seclusion. He stood at that home and he said that. Now, these are the words of the Hazrat Muslim Hazrat 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 stated that on February 20th, 1886, exactly 58 years ago, but 
in, in our case, it's going to be 138 years now. But 58 years later, uh, Hazrat Muslim also st stated that in this very city of Husharpur, in a house which is in front of me, and he pointed the finger towards that house, from where he was standing, a house which is at that time was known as an outbuilding, meaning it was a temporary place to stay and not an actual dwelling. In fact, it was an additional building of a chief similar to annexes built occasionally so the guests can stay there. An unknown individual from Qadian, now he's talking about Prophet Muhammad whom even the people of Qadian were not fully acquainted, came here upon the witnessing the enmity people harbored towards Islam and the founder of Islam, Holy Prophet He came in order to worship his Lord in seclusion and seek a sign of his help and succor. He spent 40 days in the seclusion from others and supplicated before his Lord. After 40 days of supplication, God gave him a sign that I will not fulfill the promises. I, excuse me, I will not, I will not only fulfill the promises I made to you and spread your name to the corners of the earth, but in order to fulfill this in an even more splendid manner, I will bless you with a son who will possess certain qualities he will spread Islam to the corners of the earth and explain to the people the varieties of the Holy Quran. He will be a sign of mercy and grace, and he will be endowed with the religious and secular knowledge that is essential for, for the propagation of Islam. Moreover, Allah Almighty will grant him a life, a long life, so much so that his fame will spread to the corners of the earth. This was published in Dawa Muslim Aud Ki. Mutalik for Shokat Elan in the book uh, collection of Hazrat uh, Khalifatul Sisani Anwar al Lulum, page number 140 to 141. So, with this, Jazakallah once again for coming, and we'll start the program further, inshallah. Aslam alaikum. Now we will be hearing the actual prophecy that uh, Hazrat Ramiz Musa received the revelation that uh, he received from Allah the Almighty after the, the, this 40 days of uh, uh, Chilla and uh, I would request uh, Khaled Hashmi Sahib to read that in original language that is in Urdu. Uh, you probably, most of us may not know Khaled Hashmi Sahib he is a recent uh, immigrant from Afghanistan, uh, Khalid Hashmi Shahid. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ilham Hazrat Masih Mahmud alayhi salatu wa salam. Pish gui Muslih Mahmud. Mai tujhe ek rahmat ka nishan deta hoon. Usi ke muafiq. जो तूने मुझसे मांगा सो मैं सो मैंने तेरी तजरुआत को सुना और तेरी दुआओं को अपनी रहमत से बपाए कबूलियत जगा दी और तेरे सफर को जो होशियारपुर और लुधियाना का सफर है तेरे लिए मुबारक कर दिया सो कुदरत और रहमत और कुर्बत का निशान तुझे दिया दिया जाता है फजल और एहसान का निशान तुझे अता होता है और फतहा और जफर की कलीद तुझे मिलती है ऐ मुजफर तुझ पर सलाम खुदा ने यह कहा था वो जो जिंदगी के ख्वाहां है मौत के पंजे से निजात पावे और वो जो कब्रों में दबे पड़े हैं बाहर आवे और तो दीन इस्लाम का शरफ और कलामुल्लाह का मर्तबा लोगों पर जाहिर हो और ता हक अपनी तमाम बरकतों के साथ आ जाए और बातिल अपनी तमाम नहूसतों के साथ भाग जाए और ता लोग समझे कि मैं कादिर हूं जो चाहता हूं करता हूं और ता वो यकीन दिलाए कि मैं तेरे साथ हूं और ता उन्हें जो खुदा के वजूद पर ईमान नहीं लाते और खुदा के दीन और उसकी किताब और उसके पाक रसूल मोहम्मद मुस्तफा सल्लल्लाहु अलैहि वाली वसल्लम को इंकार और तकजीब की निगाह से देखते हैं एक खुली निशानी मिले और मुजरिमों की राह जाहिर हो जाए सो बशारत हो कि एक वजीह और पाक लड़का तुझे दिया जाएगा एक जकी गुलाम तुझे मिलेगा वो लड़का तेरी ही तुखम से तेरी ही जुरियत व नस्ल होगा 
खूबसूरत पाक लड़का तुम्हारा मेहमान आता है उसका नाम अमानविल और बशीर भी है उसको मुकदस रूह दी गई है और वो रिज से पाक है वो नूरुल्लाह है मुबारक वो जो आसमान से आता है उसके साथ फजल है जो उसके आने के साथ आएगा वो साहिब शकू और अजमत और दौलत होगा वो दुनिया में आएगा और अपनी मसीही नफ्स और रूहल हक की बरकत से बहुतों को बीमारियों से साफ करेगा वो कलमतुल्ला है क्योंकि खुदा की रहमत रहमत व गयूरी ने उसे कलम तमजीद से भेजा है वो सख्त जहीम व फहीम होगा जहीन व फहीम होगा और दिल का हलीम होगा और उलूम ज़ाहरी व बातनी से पुर किया जाएगा और वो तीन को चार करने वाला होगा दुशंबा है मुबारक दुशंबा फर्जंद दिल बंद गिरामी अर्जमंद मजहर अलवलाखिर मजहर अलहक वलाए का अन्ला नजल मिनसमा जिसका नजूल बहुत मुबारक और जलाल इलाही के ूर का मौजब होगा नूर आता है नूर जिसको खुदा ने अपनी रजामंदी के इतर से ममसूह किया हम उसमें अपनी रूह डालेंगे और खुदा का साया उसके सर पर होगा वो जल जल बढ़ेगा और असीरों की रुस्तगारी का मौजब होगा और ज़मीन के किनारों तक शहरत पाएगा और कौमें उससे बरकत पाएंगी तब अपनी अब तब तब अपने नफसी नुक़ नफसी नुक़ा आसमान की तरफ उठाया जाएगा वकाना अमर मकदिया जजाकल्ला खालिद हाकम साहेब नाउ आई विल वॉन्ट टू रिक्वेस्ट सैयद अवास साहेब हु इज़ गोइंग टू रीड द इंग्लिश ट्रांसलेशन ऑफ दिस प्रोफेसी The divine revelation concerning the Muslim Aud. In the announcement of February 28th, 1886, the promised Messiah, peace be on him, says, "God, the Merciful, the Noble, the High, the Exalted, who has power to do all that He wills, glory be to Him and exalted be His name." has what save to me the following revelation i confer upon thee a sign of my mercy according to thy supplications i have heard thee i have heard thy entreaties and have honored thy prayers with my acceptance through my mercy and have blessed this thy journey a sign of power mercy nearness to me is bestowed bestowed on thee a sign of grace and beneficence is awarded to thee and thou art granted the key of success and victory peace on thee o victorious one thus does god speak so that those who desire life may be rescued from the grip of death and those who are buried in the graves may emerge therefrom and so that the truth may arrive with all its blessings and falsehood may depart with all its ills and so that people may understand that i am the lord of power i do whatever i will and so that they may believe that i am with thee and so that those who do not believe in god and deny and reject his religion and his book and his holy messenger muhammad the chosen one on whom be peace may be confronted with a clear sign and the way of the guilty ones may become manifest rejoice therefore that a handsome and pure boy will be bestowed on thee thou will receive a bright youth who will be of thy seed and will be of thy progeny a handsome and pure boy will come as your guest his name is emmanuel and bashir he has been invested with the holy spirit and he will be free 
from all impurity. He is the light of Allah. Blessed is he who comes from heaven. He shall be accompanied by grace, puzzle, which shall ar arrive with him. He will be characterized with grandeur, greatness, and wealth. He will come into the world and will heal many of their disorder through his messianic qualities and through the blessings of the Holy Spirit. He is the word of Allah, for Allah's mercy and honor have equipped him with the word of majesty. He will be extremely intelligent and understanding and will be meek of heart and will be filled with secular and spiritual knowledge. He will convert three into four. It is Monday, a blessed Monday. Son, delight of heart, high ranking, noble, a manifestation of the first and the lost, a manifestation of the true and the high, as if Allah has descended from heaven, his advent will be greatly blessed and will be a source of manifestation of divine majesty. Behold, a light cometh, a light anointed by God with, with the perfume of his pleasure. We shall pour our we shall pour our spirit into him, and he will be sheltered under the shadow of God. He will grow rapidly in stature and will be the means of procuring the release of those held in bondage. His fame will spread to the ends of the earth and people will be blessed through him. He will then be raised to his spiritual station in heaven. This is a matter decreed. Jazakallah. Jazakallah, our side. Now we are going to hear um, from Sirjil Rahu Sahib, who is our, who is serving as Khaid Muslim of Damul Ahmadiyya, Los Angeles. His uh, subject of uh, this uh, speech is Muslim Aud Prophecy, a Grand Heavenly Sign. Muslim Aud Prophecy, a Grand Heavenly Sign. Sirjil Rahu Sahib. It's good to see everyone here today um, to commemorate and remember a favor that Allah bestowed upon us um on actually the jamaat of uh, the promised messiah al islam uh back in uh when we heard the prophecies just now february 20th 1886 um so when i was younger i used to be quite ignorant to the importance of muslim mode uh the only thing i cared about in my hometown was this muslim mode tournament all we would do is play sports i didn't really listen to the speeches as much but I want to urge, I see a lot of young ones today. I think I see more Khudam than Ansar, by the way, Secretary Sarbiyatov. So I urge the young ones, just try to stay with me for 15 minutes, hopefully. And because uh, uh, it's a really interesting story and the background is very interesting uh, on how the truth of the Muslim of is uh, proved in these prophecies and in, in the uh, history behind it. So I'm going to start off by going all the way back to the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There is a hadith by him. It's uh, said, "Kad akhbara Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam anna al-Masih al-Mawda yatazawwaju wa yuladu lahu." That is to say that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has prophesied that the Promised Messiah shall marry and beget progeny. So the thing about this hadith, there's been a lot of debates on this hadith. Um, some people say that uh, it's 
said Isa ibn Maryam uh, instead of Masih Maud. We all know that Isa ibn Maryam, the second coming of Isa and Promise Messiah, that's the same person. So it's okay. We don't need to debate about that. But then there's another debate where uh, people say that after marriage, uh, after marriage and and uh, he has children, the promised Messiah will remain on the earth for 19 years. Some people have said 40 years. But there's one thing I want to bold and bring us to is what's undisputed and undebated. The one statement is, meaning the promised Messiah will marry and have children. So the Prophet Messiah, uh, he elaborates more on this hadith in his book, Ayna Kamalat Islam, which means mirrors of Islam's perfections. He says, that is to say that the Holy Prophet وسلم, has prophesied that the promised Messiah shall marry and beget progeny. In this, there is an indication that Allah the Almighty would bestow upon him <clears throat> a righteous son who would be in the likeness of his father and shall be submissive and obedient to him in every matter. And he would be from among the honored servants of Allah the Almighty. So we've, we've established that it's been prophesied from the Holy Prophet وسلم, that there will be a son to come, a promised son of the promised Messiah Islam. And this uh, promised uh, son, we all know, since we're technically in the future now, is uh, Hazrat Mirza Bashiruddin Mahmud Ahmad Razi Allah Ta'ala Anho. So there's no surprise there. But what I want to talk about is the heavenly signs that prove that Hazrat Mirza Bashiruddin Mahmud Ahmad Razi Allah Ta'ala Anho is indeed that promise reformer. So to dive into the details, before I dive into the details that was just uh, uh, provided to you of the prophecy that was just presented by Khalid Hashmi and Awais Saab, I want to give qu a quick history um, leading up to the prophecy. So in September 1885, there were about 10 wealthy Hindus. These 10 wealthy Hindus, they learned that the promised Messiah Islam had sent letters to London and to America and uh, appealed to those in the, the people in London and America, appealed to them and told them that if you are truth seekers, actual truth seekers, then come live with me in Qadian for one year and surely Allah will provide a sign within that one year that proves the truthfulness of Islam. So in response to this, when they learned of this, the 10 wealthy Hindus that are in India, they wrote to the promised Messiah Islam, accordingly, we who are your neighbors and fellow citizens have greater right than those in London and America. Yes, such signs certainly are needed, which are beyond human capability, from which it can be known that the true and holy Parmeshwar God, because of your religious righteousness and by what by way of love and grace, accepts your prayers and prior to their acceptance, intimates news of this before it is time for the manifestation of such matters, or that he informs you of some of his special secrets and by way of prophecy gives you knowledge of these secrets or helps and supports you in such amazing ways as he has been doing since eternity for his chosen elect, close, devoted ones, and those who are his select servants. So this is the letter that the Hindus wrote to the promised Messiah of Islam. When I read this letter, I know that the, the, the Hindus don't believe in Islam. They're not anywhere near Islam. Uh, but So to me, this sounds like a very sarcastic letter. You know, the way they say, you know, by way of your religious righteousness, by way of love and grace, and, you know, uh, how God informs you, how you are so, you're such a prophet and whatnot. You know, I, I feel a little bit of a mocking undertone right there. But we got to remember that the promised Messiah, Islam, is the literal embodiment of love for all, hatred for none. So he read this letter as a sincere request. And therefore he replied, if you gentlemen remain bound by the pledges that you have made in your letter, then certainly within one year, with the help and assistance of the all-powerful Lord of glory, some such sign shall be shown to you that will be beyond human capabilities. So after the Promised Messiah Islam's response to the Hindus, um, the Hindus then set a deadline that, okay, fine, you responded to us. And within one year, today is September 1885, 
will mark the deadline as September 1886. There must be a sign beyond the capability of man. So in, uh, sometime later, as Sadr Sahib also mentioned that uh, the Promised Messiah Islam traveled to Hoshiarpur, where he went into Chilla, which is a 40-day seclusion. One thing I want to note about this Chilla is it wasn't in response to these Hindus. Uh, the Promised Messiah Islam had already uh, shown some intention in 1884 that he wanted to go in seclusion, just as the Holy Prophet ﷺ used to do in Cave Hira, and the same way that Musa went up to uh, the mountains and came back with the Ten Commandments. You know, he was. They all went for 40 days in seclusion, and they prayed to Allah in, in deep, you know, uh, meditation. So, in 1885, his first uh, Promised Messiah Islam's first choice to go was to go in the city called Sujanpur, but in 1885 he re received a revelation relating to this that said your purpose will be uh, resolved in Hoshiarpur. So that's the reason why Promised Messiah Islam instead went to Hoshiarpur and cut himself off completely from the public and prayed to Allah in extreme humility. So after this, we finally arrive to the revelation of February 20th, 1886, which was presented to you. So I'm not going to repeat it because I'm short on time and already. So in response to this, prophecy that we just listened to um, from February 20th, 1886, there was a Hindu pundit, his name was Lekram, from the Arya Samaj movement. The Arya Samaj movement was one of the early movements of the Hindu, uh, uh, Hindu uh, religion. It, it was a monotheistic Hindu movement. So this pundit wrote on March 18, 1886, about a month after the prophecy, your progeny shall very soon come to an end. At the very most, your renown will remain for three years. He's talking to the promised Messiah of Islam. So he further wrote, my revelation says that let alone a son within three years, you will come to an end and there shall remain no one from among your progeny. And then the promised Messiah of Islam made an announcement on March 22nd, about four days later. Till now, which is 22 March, 1886, no male child has been born in our house other than the previous two male boys whose ages are 20 and above. But I know that such a male child will certainly be born in accord, in accord with the divine promise within a period of nine years, whether sooner or later, but in any case, within this period, he shall be born. And then he further announced that this is not only a prophecy, but also a grand heavenly sign, which has been manifested by God to demonstrate the truth and greatness of our noble prophet, the compassionate and merciful Muhammad, the chosen one, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This sign is in fact a hundreds of times more superior and more potent and majestic and glorious than the sign of bringing a dead person back to life. So you see uh, the promised Messiah, alayhi salam, he explains how great the sign is and he connects it back to the Holy Prophet Sallallahu hadith that was just presented uh, earlier. Um, and we also must note that this is also a proof of the truth of Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed Islam, that he is also indeed the promised Messiah uh, Another thing I want to note is uh, going back to Pandit Lekram that he mentioned that the promised Messiah and his entire bloodline will be extinguished within three years. And uh, a little bit of uh, jumping over to the future a little bit. When Bashir the first was born, as Sadr Saab mentioned, he passed away within one year. He even expressed joy that, look, you know, my prophecy is coming true. Within three years, you and your whole bloodline is going to extinguish. But um, I'll give a little more context on that a little bit later. What I do want to talk about is Pandit Lekram. He was a very vocal enemy of Islam. Now remember, this is 1886 or 18, yeah, 1886, right? There's no Ahmadiyyat yet, right? There's no bath that's been taken yet. The primary attacks that we see from the enemies of Islam are on Islam and the Holy Prophet And the only person who's defending this more greater than anyone is our beloved promised Messiah Islam, right? So uh, no matter how hard promised Messiah Islam tried over and over again to convince Pandit Lekram about the truth of Islam. Uh, the Pandit never changed his ways. He stuck to his anti-Islamic 
rhetoric and and continued his uh, schemes. <clears throat> so when I look at Pandit Lekram, a great enemy of Islam, making a claim that you and your entire bloodline, the Promised Messiah's entire bloodline will finish within three years, to me, it makes sense that the Promised Son then should be born within that three years, right? To double down, prove an enemy of Islam completely wrong. And of course, we know within three years, January 12, 1889, that promised Messiah is born, the promised reformer, the promised son, Hazar Muslim Ta'ala is born within that three years. So before we go into that, I want to go back to Bashir the first now. Now, Bashir the first, um, after his death, this is when, you know, the pundit is pretty much celebrating and, and you know, uh, seeing, uh, thinking that his prophecy is... Uh, is coming true now he uh, as he uh, expressed his joy the promised messiah Islam also talked about this he received revelation of bashir the first death it says do people imagine that they might be left to say we have believed and they should not be tried by allah it seems you will not stop worrying about yusuf till you make yourself ill or you expire. Turn away from such till the time arrives. For those who are steadfast, there is, there is a reward without a, a end. Now the Promised Messiah Islam elaborated on this revelation, that this revelation says that the Bashir the first, the demise of the Bashir the first is a trial or was a trial for those that were very weak in belief and uh, for those that were, you know, still on the, in the fence of whether promise of Islam is the truth or not. So it unveiled those and turned them into an enemy of Islam, technically. Um, and notice one thing that uh, the revelations shows a parallel between Yusuf and Yaqub, right? So in this revelation, the promise of Islam is kind of like Yaqub over here. Allah is telling him that don't worry just as Yaqub should not have worried because he will eventually, if he remains patient and steadfast, you will be reunited with this son, right? So I want to just jump back to the initial prophecy as well. The A few points that I want to bold in the prophecy of February 20th, 1886, that the promised Messiah, alayhi salam, received about the promised reformer. It states that a handsome and pure boy is coming as your guest. In Urdu, tumara mein maan aata hai. Right? They're, they're here temporarily. So in that prophecy, this is talking about Bashir the first, right? A guest doesn't stay for a long time. So Bashir the first was the one who's the guest that is coming, that was prophesized. And then later it states, he will be accompanied by grace, fuzzle, which shall arrive with him. In Urdu it says, uske saath fuzzle hai. Right? He will be accompanied by Bashir the first is not alone. He will be accompanied with grace. And then later, after these sentences, it talks about Bashir the second, who's the promised reformer. He will be characterized with grandeur, greatness, and wealth. Right? So uh, in December 1888, after Bashir the first death, the promised Messiah Islam received another revelation that a second Bashir will be bestowed upon you, whose name is also Mahmud. He will be a person of high resolve in his projects. So now, this is where the promised reformer, Muslim Oud, is born on January 12th, 1889. And we know his name is Hazrat Mirza Bashiruddin Mahmud Ahmed. So again, this is another uh, prophecy that that it shows, supports not only the truth of the promised Messiah al-Islam, the truth of the promised reformer, Hazrat Muslimud, as well as the truth of, of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we can see even a, a, a tiny sliver of devotion, another truth of the prophecy, we can see in the devotion of the promised, uh, the promised reformer, Razi Allah no, Hazrat Muslimud, Razi Allah no, when he... Uh, was talking to the promised Messiah al -Islam, uh, after his death. He said, even if all the people leave you and I am left alone, I would stand by you and would face all opposition and onslaughts of your mis mission. So even if Hazrat Muslim is alone, he will stand by you 
uh, he will stand by Islam Ahmadiyat, Khilafat Ahmadiyat, and face all the opposition. And we can see that with we can uh, we'll probably learn more about it in the following presentations as well on the accomplishments of Hazrat Muslim I want to quickly come back to Pandit Lehram. I don't want you guys to think that, you know, he was very vocal in his abuse of Islam and the Holy Prophet Sallallahu So he was pretty much let off easy, right? Um, so Pandit Lekram, long story short, he died at just 38 years old. And the promised Messiah Islam informed him of his death earlier. He received revelation and he tried to bring him to the truth many times. He tried to convince him of the truth of Islam, but Pandit Lekram, he wouldn't die, uh, he wouldn't uh, stop his abuse on Islam, and therefore he died a very fatal death. Um, he, he kept on going uh, in his abuse, and, and uh, his, uh, the revelations had shown that his death would be similar to the calf of Sumri. The calf of Sumri was that calf that was uh, made by those, uh, the people... Uh, when Musa came down from the Ten Commandments, there was a calf that they worshipped, a golden calf. And that calf was dismembered and burned and spread uh, in the river. Its ashes were burnt and spread in the river. Pandit Lekram was uh, stabbed by what was uh, read as an angel. He was stabbed, dismembered, and as a Hindu, he was burnt, and his ashes were spread among the river. Um, in India, just as Hindus do for their uh, cremation ceremony at the time of Hindu's death. So I want to mention, like, I'm way ahead of time. I'm at 18 minutes, so I have to cut it short. I want to implore all of the youngsters uh, that I was barely able to scratch the surface. I want you guys to go and read about the background of this prophecy and look through, you know, all of the truths that support don't just accept the fact, that, okay, yeah, fine, he's the truth, we get it, and live by it. Actually go and read it. Strengthen your own faith with uh, with this prophecy as well. So I appeal to you all to, to read all the details because there's so much more that I wasn't able to cover. I want to conclude with the message of the youth, a final message of the youth of the Jamaat from Hazrat Muslim Allah. He says, May God be your protector and a helper and keep you from faltering. May the standard of Jamaat always fly high. Let the voice of Islam be not reduced to a whisper. May the holy name of Allah not fade away. Study the Quran and Hadith, teach it to each other, and act upon it yourselves. Exhort others to follow these teachings also. May there always be people among you who will devote their lives for Islam. Long live Khilafat. And may there be believers among you who are ready to give their lives for its maintenance. May the truth be your ornament, trust in Allah, your beauty, and fear of Allah, your garment. May God be with you and you be with him. Ameen. Jazakallah. Jazakallah, Sir Jil Roof Sahib. This subject is a very vast and need a lot of uh, um, explanation in a way uh, when Hazrat Pamir Musa um, at his time. Now today, after more than 100 years, we have seen all these things, uh, what happened to Pamir Musa Salam, what happened, how this prophecy was fulfilled. I was thinking and uh, the entire thing is came to my mind in early uh, 80s when Ziaul Haq Sahib um, uh, promulgated his uh, ordinance in Pakistan. At that time in Bangladesh, we are hearing that this is happening in Pakistan. The Jamaat was established by Mirza Bashiruddin Mahmud Ahmed. So that was the feeling that they have, although they have wrong information, because of the uh, uh, the contribution of Hazrat Muslim Mahmud Anhu in favor or in 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 relation to the prophecy that Hazrat Pramid Musa made, so he, it made him such a extent that in Bangladesh at that time, the general newspaper Nona Ahmadi they were mentioning 
that he was the founder of Ahmadiyya Muslim community. So his prophecy, this prophecy was fulfilled in a such a degree that the outside people, they cannot ignore it. And they, they even thought that he was the founder of this uh, community. Mm -hmm. Now we are going to hear from uh, our, uh, a slide presentation by uh, Naeem Mahmoud Sahib, who is currently serving as uh, Secretary Halka, uh, Secretary Terbiyat of Riverside Halka. He is going to present that uh, their slide presentation where actually is a synopsis of the entire this uh, from the beginning of this prophecy what is meaning of Muslim out what all this thing it is going to be mentioned here and how in a short presentation that how this prophecy was fulfilled it is going to be a slide presentation I request uh, Naim Muhammad Sahib to please present that as mentioned, I was asked to present a synopsis of uh, Hazrat uh, Muslim Maud. The, the slides up. Uh, when reviewing the presentation, I asked myself if my son, Nabil, who you all know, he is six. So I was trying to ensure that I present some content that uh, folks who are younger can understand in a very elementary manner. So we've heard a lot today, Muslim Maud, Muslim Maud. What, what is exactly the meaning of Muslim Maud, right? So the second Khalifa for Jamaat, Hazrat Mirza Bashiruddin Mahmoud Ahmad. May Allah be pleased with him. It's often called Muslim Maud. So Maud means promised. And Musli means reformer. So when you add this together, this Muslim Maud translates to promised reform. Where does the term Muslim Maud come from? So this relates to the prophecy of the Prophet Sallallahu which we heard earlier today. At the time of the Prophet Sallallahu there was much hostility towards Islam from the Christian missionaries and the Hindus of the time, which Qaid Saab just mentioned to us earlier. And this caused much distress to the Prophet Islam. He could not bear to see the religion of Islam being attacked from every direction, with no one else amongst the Muslims being capable or willing to stand up and defend the religion of the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu decided to travel to a small city called Hoshiapur, as also mentioned earlier, to isolate himself for 40 days, seeking the nearness of God Almighty through constant worship. He spent the next 40 days while there, praying in a room, worshiping Allah the Almighty. And it was during this time that he received a lot of direct communication from Allah Ta'ala, and on the 20th of February, 1886, as mentioned earlier, he published a leaflet which stated that God Almighty had informed him that a child would be born to him who would greatly assist in the service of Islam. This prophecy was quite lengthy, as we've heard, and it has 52 separate qualities that the child would possess. Just to name a few of the qualities that he would be blessed with, the Holy Spirit, he would be the light of Allah, he would be handsome and pure, free from all impurity, intelligent, a direct sign of Allah's mercy, meek of heart, heal many ills of the world, convert three into four, and fame would spread to the ends of the earth. So no ordinary person could predict that he would bear a son let alone to say that he would become famous the world over and would be an international leader and bear all of the qualities that were uh, that were mentioned within the prophecy. Yet the Prophet Sallallahu who lived in the remote town of Qadian, made this prophecy and predicted that a child would be born within nine years. 
The Prophet Salaam, as mentioned earlier, was soon blessed with the birth of a baby girl named Ismat. However, she passed away in infancy. And then the son, Bashir, was born, but he too passed away. The opponents of the Prophet Salaam would taunt him after these tragedies, claiming that God forbid the Prophet Salaam was a liar and a fraud. If he had, God forbid, been a fraudster, then perhaps the Prophet Salaam, having witnessed the death of two children so young, may have also taken back his claims. Imagine for an ordinary person, you go and you make a claim and a couple of things happen and you go, you know, you know what, maybe I should take this back. But no, Promise Messiah was a different person. He was a Promise Messiah. And similarly, this was not just some ordinary claim, but he received this revelation from Allah Ta'ala. He had full certainty that, was, that what was decreed by God Almighty would occur. And he repeatedly reminded those who had mocked him that the period of the prophecy had nine years for this child to be born. So we see on the 12th of January, 1889, the Prophet Messiah was blessed with a son named Azra Mirza, named Mashir, Mirza Bashir Adin Mahmoud Ahmad. May Allah be pleased with him. In his person, every single one of the qualities promised by the Prophet Messiah, promised by God Almighty to the Prophet Messiah was fulfilled with great magnificence. We all know that the Achievements of Hazrat Muslim Maud Razi Allah Anhu are innumerable, but of, here are a selected few of them. He was elected Khalifa to Masi at the age of 25 and served as the Khalifa of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community for 52 years. He wrote the famous and extraordinary commentaries of the Holy Quran, known as Tafsir Sagir and Tafsir Kabir. He established much of the organization of the Jamaat including our auxiliary organizations, Majlis Ansar Allah, Lajna Ma'ala, Quran Ahmadiyya, Nasratul Ahmadiyya, and Fala Ahmadiyya, one of these organizations which each of us falls into. He established the schemes of Tariqa Jadid and Waqfa Jadid for the spreading of Islam far and wide. He led the establishment, he led the Jamaat through the partition of India and the establishment of Rabwa and Pakistan. And he traveled to the UK in 1924 to attend the Conference of Living Religions and laid the foundation stone for which the first mosque in the United Kingdom, which was to be called Majid, Majid Fazl, the Mosque of Blessings. Many of us have been there. Despite the many clear signs that he was a Muslim Aoud, Hazrat Mirza Bashir Adin Mahmoud Ahmad, may Allah be pleased with him, repeatedly refused to make the claim of being the Muslim Maud until he was directed by God Almighty. In 1944, he was informed by God Almighty that he was, in fact, the true fulfillment of the prophecy and that he should inform the world. Thus, Hazrat Muslim Maud Razi Allah Talanho traveled to Hoshiapur where the Prophet Messiah had received the glad tidings of his birth and proclaimed in public that he was the fulfillment of that prophecy. Thereafter, he then traveled to other parts of India and publicly proclaimed his status. And by doing so, he was not in any way trying to exaggerate or highlight his own status, but really he was highlighting the truth of the Prophet Messiah and the majesty of God Almighty. So as uh, Sadr Sahib had mentioned earlier, even in the latest Friday sermon of Hazrat Khalifa al-Masih, Ayatollah bin Aziz, what is the reason why we are celebrating this Muslim Maud Day? Again, it is not to celebrate his birthday. It is not us celebrating the birthday of the Hazrat Muslim Maud, but rather to celebrate the truth of Islam and the promise of Sayyidullah through the magnificent fulfillment of this prophecy. Jazakallah.
Jazakallah, Naim Muhammad Sahib. Now we are going to hear another poem written by Hazrat Muslim Aud Rajallahu Talanhu. And I am requesting Dr. Tahir Khan Sahib to come to the podium and uh, recite that poem. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuhu. Pakiza Kalam, Hazrat Muslim Aud Razila Talanho. Say Chand Ashar Apki Khidbadme Pesh Karta. Hai Daste Kibla Numa. Hai Daste Kibla Numa. La Ilaha Illa La Ilaha Illa La La Ilaha Illa La Hedar De Dil Ki Dava Hedar De Dil Ki Dava La Ilaha illa la la ilaha illa la la ilaha illa la kisi ki chashme fusu saaz ne kiya jadu to dil se nikli sada to dil se nikli sada la ilaha illa allah la ilaha illa allah la ilaha illa allah जो फूंका जाएगा कानों में दिल के मुर्दों के जो फूंका जाएगा कानों में दिल के मुर्दों के करेगा हशर बपार Karega hashir bapa la ilaha illa la la ilaha illa la la ilaha illa la karib tha ke mein gir jau Bare isyan se Kareeb tha ke mein gir jau Bare isyan se Bana hai lek asa Bana hai lek asa La Ilaha illa la la ilaha illa la la ilaha illa la gira nahi rahi baki koi mere dil ki gira Nahi rahi baki koi mere dil ki Hua hai uqda kusha Hua hai uqda kusha La ilaha illa la La Ilaha illa la la ilaha illa la 
तेरा तो दिल है सनम खाना फिर तुझे क्या नफा तेरा तो दिल है सनम खाना फिर तुझे क्या नफा अगर जुबान से कहा अगर जुबान से कहा इलाहा ला इलाहा ला इलाहा बरोजे हश्र सभी तेरा साथ छोड़ेंगे बरोजे हश्र सभी तेरा साथ छोड़ेंगे करेगा एक वफा करेगा एक वफा इलाहा ला ला इलाहा ला इलाहा ला ला इलाहा ला ला इलाहा इलाहा है दस्ते कबला नुमा है दर्द दिल की दवा इलाहा 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 ला ला इलाहा इलाहा जजाकल्ला ताहिर खान साहिब आई फॉट टू मैंशन दैट ही इज ऑल्सो सर्विंग ही इज सर्विंग एज द हल्का सदर ऑफ ऑरेंज काउंटी हल्का now i am going to request uh, samsil haq tayyib sahib who is going to read the translation english translation of this poem uh, samsil haq tayyib sahib is uh, serving as the general secretary of uh, uh, pikoriwara halka samsil haq tayyib السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ فالوئنگ از دی انگلش ٹرانسلیشن اف دی سلیکٹڈ کپلٹس جس ریسائڈڈ فرام ا پوئم ریٹن بائے حضرت مسلم اعوذ رضی اللہ تعالی عنہ مائی ہینڈز ار ریز ٹوورڈز دی ڈائریکشن اف دی قبلا لا الہ الا اللہ دی ایلکسر to all the sorrows and pain of heart is la ilaha illallah someone's magical sight did magic so the voice of my heart could pronounce la ilaha illallah that which will be blown in the ears of the spiritually dead and will bring doomsday is la ilaha illallah i was close to falling down due to the burdens of my sins but what supported me was la ilaha illallah no iota of doubt is left in my heart and that which clears all the difficulties is la ilaha illallah If your heart is a shrine then what is the gain in only verbally pronouncing la ilaha illallah the tyranny of disbelief will disappear instantly when allah will show his power and clamor through la ilaha illallah on the day of judgment 
one will be deserted by all except for one faithful. There are hundreds of thousands spiritual treatments, but the only spiritual cure is la ilaha illallah. Jazakallah. Jazakallah, Shamsulak Tayyip Sahib. At this time, I want to speak about some of the scholarly work of Hazrat Muslim Anhu. It is necessary to keep in view the fact that Hazrat Muslim Anhu had very poor health as a child. His childhood was spent with many ailments. He also had difficulties with his vision, and at one point, he began to lose vision in one eye. Furthermore, he had little to no secular education. Furthermore, he had little to no secular education. He struggled to complete his primary education. But as he states himself, it was the promise of Allah, the Almighty, that he would be endowed with secular and spiritual knowledge. In light of this, Allah the Almighty enabled him to deliver such extraordinary addresses and sermons that left others astounded. And all his various writings are in a class of his of their own. I will put forward you an overview of the sheer quantities of his literary work, his speeches, essays, addresses, question and answer session, and so forth. His books, addresses, lectures, essays, letters, and other works that are completed and published in the form of Anwar al-Ulum, an Urdu uh, book, and some materials that is already almost ready to be published and will be included in this collection will have a total 38 volumes. This volume contains 1,424 literary works that comprises more than 20,000 pages, or so it is estimated. The tafsir kabir tafsir sagir and other exegetical works amount to a total of 28,700 plus pages. There are more than 1,800 Friday sermons, which amount to almost 19,000 pages. There are 51 Eidul Fitr sermons, which amount to 503 pages. There are 42 Eidul Adhya sermons, which amount 405 pages. There are 150 Nikah sermons, which amount to 684 pages. The first three volumes of his Shura sermons, which are comprises of 2,131 pages, have been published. If all these literary works and some other are combined, they amount to a total of approximately 75,000 pages. The research cell has looked through the archive from 1913 to 1970 of Al-Hakam and Al-Fazal and was found some work that has not yet been published in Anwar al -Ulum or in any other publications. According to that report, 55 articles, 27 addresses, 143 question and answer sessions, 222 spoken discourses, and 131 letters have been found. This is indeed a vast treasure of knowledge. Today, we displayed a small number of these books. So you can see over there on that side and also on the Ladies side, we put some. These are the books that written by Hazrat Muslim Aoud and those who are translated into English. Uh, there is many other books that he wrote, as I mentioned. His collection of writings or his discourse is more than 75,000 books. We did not brought Tafsir Kabir or Tafsir Sagir here. We're just showing only the English books that are translated and not only that, those are currently available in um, AMI bookstore in, uh, in Maryland, Washington, DC. 
this is we presenting this thing so that our younger generation as well as the other members who knows that these are the books those are available right now and it is very easy to obtain these books from um, uh, AMI bookstore you can go to uh, um, online and you can click there and just ask them that book uh, pay some very small amount of price and they will ship you very quickly we ordered this in last uh, Monday, that was a holiday, and they shipped it Tuesday, we received in Thursday, that many books here. So it is easy uh, for us to collect. We know nowadays we all read in telephone in the uh, electronic format, but sometimes it is good to change that habit and read from these books. This and there is small books, large books, uh, those are available. So I will request the purpose of this show is here so that our younger generation as well as our members can benefit from it and they can um, get those books from um, uh, AMI bookstore. Now we are going to uh, uh, listen from his own words, the Muslim Maud Razi It is a MKA presentation. I request, uh, please uh, run that video. Or audio. Fazle Umar Tere Osa Pe Kari Mana اے فضل عمر تیرے اوسا پہ کری مانا اور اس نوبت کے بجنا بجنے پر جو سپاہی جمع ہوا کرتے تھے وہ کروڑوں سے دسیوں پر آ گئے اور ان میں سے بھی ننانوے فیصدی سے رسمن اٹھ کے بیٹھے کرتے چلے گئے نوبت کھانے کی آواز میں روک جاتا تھا اسلام کا سایہ کھینچنے لگ گیا خدا کی حکومت پھر آسمان پر گئی اور دنیا پھر شیطان کے قبضے میں گئی اب خدا کی غلط پھر جوش میں آئی ہے اور تم کو ہاں تم کو ہاں تم کو خدا تعالیٰ نے پھر اس نوبت کھانے کی شکل سمجھ دی ہے اے آسمانی بادشاہت کے موسی کرو اے آسمانی بادشاہ کے موسی کرو اے آسمانی بادشاہ کے موسی کرو ایک دفعہ پھر اس نوبت کو زور سے بچاؤ کہ دنیا کے کام کھل جائیں ایک دفعہ پھر اپنے دل کے خون اس کر نہ میں بھر دو ایک دفعہ پھر اپنے دل کے خون اس کر نہ میں بھر دو کہ ہر اس کے پاؤں بھی لڑ جائے ایک دفعہ پھر اپنے دل کے خون اس کر نہ میں بھر دو کہ ہر اس کے پاؤں بھی لڑ جائیں اور فرشتے بھی کام اٹھیں تاکہ تمہاری درد نا کا آواز اور تمہارے نعرے تقدیر اور تمہارے نعرے تشہیر شہادت توحید کی وجہ سے خدا تعالیٰ آسمان کو زمین پر آ جائے اور پھر خدا کی بات کا دل زمین پر کام اسی غرض کے لیے میں نے تحریک جدید کو جاری کیا ہے اور اسی طرح کے لیے میں تمہیں وقت کی تبلیغ کی تعلیم دیتا ہوں ادھر آؤ اور خدا کے سپاہیوں میں داخل ہو محمد رسول اللہ صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم کا تخت آج مسیح نے چھینا ہوا ہے تم نے مسیح سے چھین کے پھر وہ تخت محمد رسول اللہ کو دینا ہے اور محمد رسول اللہ نے وہ تخت خدا کے آگے پیش کرنا ہے اور خدا کی بادشاہ جی نے مکانی بس میری سنو اور میری بات کے پیچھے چلو کہ میں جو کچھ کہہ رہا ہوں وہ خدا کہہ رہا ہے میری آواز نہیں ہے میں خدا کی آواز کو بجا رہا ہوں تم میری مانو خدا تمہارے ساتھ ہو خدا تمہارے ساتھ ہو خدا تمہارے ساتھ ہو اور تم دنیا میں بھی عزت پاؤ اور آخرت میں بھی عزت پاؤ اس کے بعد میں جلسے کو دعا کے بعد ختم کرتا ہوں اور پھر آپ کو یاد دلاتا ہوں کہ جو مبلدین کی بار سے آئی ہیں سارے آئی ہیں ان کے لیے بھی دعا کرو 
अपने लिए भी दुआ करो अपने घर वालों के लिए भी दुआ करो जो एम जी पीछे रह गए उनके लिए भी दुआ करो और अल्लाह ताला से सबसे ज्यादा तो ये दुआ मांगो कि हम में से हर एक शख्स को खुदा तला एक सच्चा अब्द और अपने दीन की खिदमत करने वाला बनाए और हमसे कोई ऐसी कमजोरी जाहिर न हो जिसकी वजह से इस्लाम और कुरान को ऐसी रसुल्ला के दीन को नुकसान पड़े बल्कि अल्लाह ताला हमको ऐसी खिदमत की तोफीक दे कि हमारे जरिए से इस्लाम से ताकत पकड़े और कुत पकड़े और हम अपनी आंखों से खुदा और उसके रसूल की बादशाह को सुनने में देख लें और हमारी जिस तरह पैदाइशें एक अफसरदा दुनिया में हुई हैं हमारी मौतें एक खुश दुनिया में हों और हम अपने पीछे उस दुनिया को छोड़ के जाए जिस पर हमारे खुदाए वाहिर का कब्जा हो और शैतान के जीने से निकाल दें फसले उमर तेरे ओ सा करी माना फजले उमर तेरे औसा करे माना जजाकल्ला फॉर शोइंग दिस ऑडियो इफ आई रिमेंबर करेक्टली दिस वॉज ए लेक्चर डिलीवर्ड बाय हजरत मुस्लिम रजी लाव तलाम हो it was uh, almost i believe 5 to or more than 6 hour of lecture that he delivered and from there we just collected a little bit of that now murbi sahib respected uh, missionary mahmud qasir sahib is going to uh, make the concluding remark السلام علیکم ورحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ اشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشیطان الرجیم بسمیل اللہ bearing witness in equity and let not a people's enmity incite you to act otherwise than with justice be always just that is nearer to righteousness and fear allah surely allah is aware of what you do we are living in a time that has been prophesized by every single nation and prophet of the past they have spoken about this era that you and i live in and described it as the final battle between satan and the angels a spiritual battle that would ensue and create havoc and destruction around the world but ultimately there will be one victorious person and that would be the one sent by god this was a time when the jal would appear gog and magog so many other elements that would appear in this era 
that would create all kinds of destruction, injustices, killing one another. In fact, if you were to look at the prophecies highlighted by Isa alayhi salam in the Bible alone, and you will see that Jesus spoke about nations rising against, rising against nation, kingdom against kingdom, pestilence, earthquake, famine, natural destruction, natural disasters, so much as well as technological advancements and technological warfare. All of this was described many thousands of years ago by almost every single leader or spiritual head of every single movement or every single religious form. In fact, if you were to examine the Holy Quran alone, many of you have read it in various places, and you will notice that sometimes it was a single nation that had a single evil that existed, and God sent them a prophet. Whether it was financial misdealings, God would send them a prophet. Whether it was uh, fornication or adultery or alcoholism or whatever it may be, God would send a prophet to guide the people because they were headed on this trajectory of evil, a trajectory that would lead them to self-destruction. But I can guarantee you every single evil that is highlighted in the Holy Quran with the thousands or the hundreds or even the dozens of prophets identified in the Holy Quran, all of those evils I can find you in this very zip code of this mosque alone. Forget other cities and nations and countries and times. All of those evils are happening as we are sitting here right now and speaking to one another. Whether it's murder, whether it's abuse, whether it's one destruction or another, one evil or another, one sin or another, all of them are occurring right now. So how on earth can anybody wake up in the morning and assume that God would let these people or this era and this time be without a prophet and without a guide? When there were but small evils, God sent prophets. What destructive nature existed at Isa alayhi salam? What about Musa alayhi salam? And yet God sent a prophet. And today, we're looking around the world, and many of you are probably very perturbed and disturbed and confused. How could all of this injustice be happening around us today? Why would God Almighty allow this to happen today? But the point is, God does intervene. And in time, since time immemorial, we have seen whenever a people is headed towards self-destruction, God sends somebody. That's his intervention. And when that somebody comes, they call the people towards the right way, towards the path that would lead them to survival, progress, happiness. Adam alayhi salam, one example. His people lived in caves. They roamed around naked and they would not have, they had no concept of marriage. They would fornicate as they pleased. Adam alayhi salam said, if you continue this way, you as a people would never continue to progress in the way that God wants you to progress. I have a suggestion. Why don't we leave these caves, live together, institute a concept of marriage, and how about let's put some clothes on? Three very simple concepts that are found in the Holy Quran. You and I exhibit all three of these Simple principles in our lives today without even thinking about it. Nobody has to fend for themselves. Some of you are doing one aspect of, in the society. Others are doing others. And this way we are living together. Not each and every one of us has to fend for ourselves and find our own food, cook our own food. This was the era called the Neolithic era where people began farming for the first time. We started growing our own fruit. God guided Hazrat Adam alayhi salam to set this world on a trajectory of success and progress. Every time society is heading towards self-destruction, God sends somebody. Adam is one example. Every prophet, you will notice the same example. And of course, you notice that the coming of the holy prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam was no different. He also predicted a time that the promised Messiah alayhi salam would come. In fact, every major religion today prophesies of this time, 
a time of destruction. Buddhism, they believe a Buddha or a prophet would come in this era. Even Hindus believe Krishna would return in this era. Muslims believe the Imam Mahdi and the Messiah would come. Christians believe in the Messiah would come. All of these people are waiting for a person to come in this very era. And you are the only people on the face of this earth that have embraced that person. Therefore, your goals and your aims have to be high. Now, when we look around us, we see these injustices are increasing. Destruction is increasing. Hatred, killing. Look at Gaza. How many of us are not absolutely disturbed, sleepless nights looking at the images of these children and these women who are being mercilessly killed every day? And this is not something new. They have been going through this for decades. The question is, what do we do now? Well, I assure you, there is one light of hope that exists. There is somebody or something that is putting out these fires, and that is Ahmadiyyat. And this is not just a claim. I will show you and describe to you our own history that plays true to what I'm saying to you now. We have always been in the forefront. Always been there to put out these fires, to remove the root causes of these injustices, to set a path for this world in this battle between Satan and God. This was a seed. Ahmadiyyat was a seed planted by God. And it is continuously growing. And you and I are the results of that tree that is still growing. Much work still has to be done. And that's why we are blessed to have a Khalifa who continues this work today. And what we are celebrating today is Muslim Out Day. And why that's important is because this spiritual battle is not a spiritual battle of just Salat and worship and Ramadan and Roza. No. There's a greater element at play here. When we look at the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he didn't just speak about Salat and worship. He spoke about every aspect of our lives. Every element of your life. He outlined it. Because we're not hermits. We're not monks. We don't live outside of this world. We live within this world. And so in order for us to excel spiritually, we have to improve the world around us. For example, the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam spoke about financial matters in great detail. He spoke about political justice, political alliances, social evils, social trends, alcoholism, womanizing, you name it, every aspect of our lives around us, he spoke about it. So this idea that when we come to the mosque, we're only going to talk about religious stuff, we have to realize and understand that religion, true religion, has everything to do with every aspect of our lives. And so adjusting those things, whether they're financially related, they're related to engagement in war, whatever it may be, there is guidance and there is faith and there is religion there to guide it. Islam says that we have to find a balance between the world, both the, the physical world and the spiritual world. That leads me to what the Holy Prophet Muhammad وسلم, had predicted. He said, يَتَزَوَّجُ وَيُولُدُ لَهُ that the, whole, the promised Messiah would come, he would get married, and he would have children. Now, who doesn't get married and who doesn't have children? Why is it so unique? Because he was explaining in a subtle way that the seed that would be planted by the promised Messiah would continue to flourish by those who were his own seed as well, those who were his children. And we know. That one such person who fulfilled that in letter and spirit was none other than Hazrat Muslim Aud Razi Talano, who through divine decree became a Khalifa at the age of 25. And through divine decree, he continued to build up and establish this Jamaat, all because of those prophetic words that were spoken to the promised Messiah about a son 
who would fulfill all of these requirements and would continue in this battle between Satan and God. Now today I want to ask, highlight an aspect of the prophecy. That is, God says, He will come into the world and will heal many of their disorder through His messianic qualities. Promised Messiah Islam came as a champion of this battle. He, he, he sowed the seed so that this tree would grow. And then God promises the promised Messiah that don't worry, the prophecy is what? Your son will be born and he will continue your mission as a Messiah in his messianic qualities. He will continue to remove the disorders around us and heal many that are affected by these injustices. What disorders do we see today? Is Gaza not a situation of a great disorder, an injustice? What about Ukraine? What about the brutality we see among, among police, for example? Or what about migrant children being put in jail at the border? So many different instances we see every day of policies, practices, things that have a lot to do with politics. And that is why the question that comes to mind is what can we do? How can we change the tides of this time? So I want to highlight what did Hazrat Muslim do in his era, in his time, to create some change, some meaningful change. Where did he speak up? What did he do in the political realm of things? And why did he do it? In fact, I want to highlight very specifically, the political change that he brought about. Now, many may think, well, he was a Khalifa. Why was he getting involved in politics? And I will outline for you seven principles that he created, or that he practiced or followed, I should say, to create meaningful change, political change. And then you will also notice that if any politician had enough decency to follow these seven principles, they would no longer be considered that politician that we define on a normal basis. They could then create change not within the years that politicians normally take, but in days. The first I would like to highlight, and I'm going to read portions of it from the original text of Hazrat Muslim al as well, so those of us who can benefit from that and really get a glimpse of what he was saying and how powerful it was. The first and foremost principle is that you should always look at political change through the lens of your deen, of your faith. As a Muslim mother says, I understand the politics of this is why I look at the politics of religion as a deen. Because the laws of Islam are not clear. That's why when I look at the laws of Islam as a deen of religion, he says, I only look at politics through the lens of my faith, through the lens of my deen. And since the rules of Islam are foundational, so when I look at any rule of law based on Islam, it becomes fairly easy to understand. The second principle, and again, this principle is critical for us. Many of us get involved in this political pull here and there. And we forget that we should always make sure that we're getting involved with the lens of our faith. The second, the objective of political change is sometimes you have to speak up to end corruption. In a Friday sermon of 1932, Hazrat Muslim said, गुजरता सालों में जब कांग्रेस की तहरीक जोरों पर थी उस वक्त मैंने अपने जमात के दोस्तों से कहा था कि वो इस इसका मुकाबला करें और ये मैंने इसीलिए कहा था कि मेरे नजदीक मुल्क का अमन नहायत जरूरी चीज है he says that i i urge my jamaat 
that they should in fact challenge the schemes of the Congress of that time as they are at rise. He further says, because peace in the country is critical and eliminating chaos and corruption is the duty of the believers. Look at your country, look at where you need to speak up, make sure you create that change. Number three, eliminate the root cause of all evil. It's very easy to get involved in politics or political jargon and political push here and there, but are we looking at the root cause? Are we identifying what the problem really is? To give you one example, Hazrat Muslim said that hunger is a critical factor that religion plays an active role in making sure it limit, li limits and regulates how a government operates allowing certain people to be homeless and hungry. What he meant by that was, if you allow people to be hungry, it will lead to sin. It will lead to unrest. It will lead to evil in a society. So eliminate the root cause. Don't simply put people in jail and assume that their issues should go away. If they are hungry, they are stealing because of a necessity, not because of a habitual problem or behavior. And so identifying that, then he went further. He said countries should in fact not limit their political lines. He said these countries have political lines and they have these border controls and they have these ways in which they stop people from coming in. And he gave the example. He said, look at Australia as compared to India of his time. He said India is limited on their resources. Their land is limited. Australia has only a few hundred thousand people. India has 40 million people. How is it okay that Australia can limit their resources of survival and not allow Indians to ever enter that country or benefit from those resources? He even explains, he said, look at South Africa. How on earth could we look at a South Africa and realize that they are doing injustice to their own people, the inhabitants of their own country? And then he highlights, he says, look at Gandhi. That's his entire, entire message is about the injustices he saw back in South Africa when he lived there. These are the words of Hazrat Muslim and how he was reflecting on the time and on the political nature of the world and showing and guiding different people in different ways. Today, for example, there's a pro-life and pro-choice debate in our country. And that debate will continue. And you and I can pick a side and have a conversation but how many of us have taken a moment to look at the root cause? The moment you use the lens of faith and look at the root cause of the pro-life and pro-choice situation, you yourself will be given a very clear answer. Number four, we should tackle the issues that sometimes change face. What he meant was that some matters some issues are very worldly, very political in nature and have nothing to do with your faith and your religion. But they can quickly change face and become religiously oriented. For example, and I will quote, I see that many of our friends do not have a faith in this world that the world is a world of the world. At one time, one thing that is the whole world of the world دوسرے وقت میں ساری کی ساری دین ہو, ہو جاتی ہے مگر پھر بھی کئی دوست ایسے ہیں جو اس لیے ان امور میں دلچسپی نہیں لیتے کہ وہ خیال کرتے ہیں یہ دنیاوی کام ہیں ان کا دین سے کوئی تعلق نہیں وہ اپنے آپ کو اور لوگوں سے کچھ کچھ بالا سمجھتے ہیں ان کی مثال بالکل ان نمرداروں کی سی ہے, ہوتی ہے جن کا ذکر حضرت خلیفہ تمسی اول رضی اللہ عنہ فرمایا کرتے تھے ہی سیز آئی سی اینڈ آئی نوٹس دا سم آف آر فرینڈس آر ناٹ اویئر دیٹ ان دس ورلڈ وی ہیو ریلیجیس میٹرز اینڈ ورلڈلی میٹرز اینڈ سم ٹائمز دے کین مکس ایٹ ون پوائنٹ اے ویری ورلڈلی میٹر کین سوئچ ان اے بلنک آف این آئی اینڈ بیکم اے ریلیجیس میٹر بٹ مینی آف آر فرینڈس آر سچ that they don't have any interest in this, in these matters. And they think 
that these are just worldly issues and that religion has nothing to do with them. And then they start to think that they are greater than these problems. They have no issue with them. They, they have an arrogance there. He says this example has been given by Hazrat Khalid Munsi Awwal in the past. Again, we should not remain quiet. We should speak up and we should understand that some issues are being brought to the table because they are religious in nature now. And they may not have been in the past. Number five, we have to speak up. We've all heard the, the slogan of loyalty to your country is part of your faith. It does not say loyalty to a party is part of your faith. Loyalty to your country. What is right, you must speak up. What is wrong, you must identify and speak up. You have to be willing to speak up because obedience does not imply that you are afraid to speak a word of truth openly. As the Muslim world even says, that sometimes there are principles Sometimes there are things that the opposition party will say. He said, but they're good things. He said, I have the courage and I have the ability to say they are good things. It doesn't matter that the opposing party said it. I will accept that they are good. He said, but also, if the ruling party speaks up and says something that's wrong, I know that I have the courage that I will speak up and tell them the truth. Speak truth to power. That is originally from the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Today, I just want to give you a realization. If we talk about the Gaza situation alone, there's many issues. But look at this. Every time the UN has tried to propose a resolution of ceasefire, there's only one country that has consistently vetoed it. One time after another. That is the United States. Now why that's important? Because today... I can assure you there's Ahmadi sitting in Canada or Uganda or India who are frustrated. They want to see an end to this brutality of our fellow brothers and sisters in Palestine. And all they see is it's America that keeps doing, keeps saying, keep refusing a ceasefire. And you know what probably goes through their mind? I wish I was in America to speak truth to power. I wish I was in America to create enough awareness, enough noise to change the politicians so that next time a resolution came, they would, instead of saying no, they would say yes. You and I have to now function on their behalf. Put that spirit in us. Speak up. Our beloved Hazrat Khalifa al Masih not once, half a dozen times has asked us, in your social circles, make noise, make change. Nobody is stopping any one of you as, a, as an American to go and knock on your congressman's door. How many of us have done it? It's okay. You can boycott Starbucks. But what is that meaningful change that's going to do? An actual difference. Nobody is stopping anybody from knocking on someone's door, having a conversation, pushing your, your political leaders to make a difference. This is exactly what the Muslim had outlined for us. Number six, serve humanity. Whatever you do should serve a greater purpose. Remember, we're still in that spiritual battle. We're still the ones who have to create that change. So in our involvement, even in politics, should be based on the central theme of love for humanity, service for humanity, and not personal gain. I'll read to you two quotes of Hazrat Muslim they're very interesting. In one he says, Yehi Hindustaniyo mein naks hai ki awal to wo kaam nahi karte aur jab karte hain to maan khayal a jata hai ki hume kuch iske badle mein milna chahiye. Halanke mere nazdik agar hum koi kaam isliye karte hain ki hume uske badle mein kuch milega to us kaam ke karne se doob marna behtar hai. He says, I've seen that many of these Indians or these fellow citizens of the country will do something, but immediately they will expect they should receive something in return. 
He says, but according to me, the way I see it, if anybody does work, any kind of work, any kind of service with this intention that they're going to receive something in return, he said it's better if they had died or wished for death. And another place he says, Mujhe taajjub aata hai. Abhi tak hamari jamaat mein ye, ye bulandi paida nahi hui. Kei log hain jo likh dete hain fala mokke par maine government ka fala kaam kiya tha ab mujhe zarurat hai mera fala kaam karwa diya jaye. The Muslim one says mujhe is waqt yun malum hota hai ke usne goya मेरे मुंह पर चपेर मार दी मैं हैरान होता हूं कि स्वाय किसी जाति फायदे की तमन्ना के हम क्यों काम नहीं कर सकते the muslim all says i'm flabbergasted i'm totally astonished with this idea that in our jamaat this idea of sacrifice or service in its in its peak or this real essence has not been ingrained in our jamaat yet I've seen people write to the government that they have done so and so favor for the government and now they want to get so and so favor in return. He said, when I see this, it's as though they have slapped me in the face with such a statement. He said, I am totally astonished that why doesn't our Jama do things or serve in a way which they do not expect anything in return. And the seventh and last aspect I want to share with you is that everything that we do should be based on the Quran. Many a times you will notice that there are political trends. There are winds of change in the political world. Sometimes there's one way we're looking at things and then a few months later you notice the stance has changed and the whole political realm is now expecting you to change your stance as well. It's all based on this bandwagon mentality. You jump on the bandwagon today, you're part of this one movement and then tomorrow it's another movement. How loud was BLM and now how quiet is it? So many of these political changes happen constantly. But the question is, are you and I on this path for change inevitably or just political trends? Have we adopted this for the sake of the greater good or not? And I will quote, as the Muslim says, I have said in the political world, قرآن مجید کے ماتحت دیا ہے اس لیے مجھے کبھی بھی اپنی رائے بدلنے کی ضرورت محسوس نہیں ہوئی بساو کا ایسا تاریخ وقت آیا کہ لوگوں نے کہا اب نہائیت نازک گھڑی ہے اور بساو کا مجھے دوستوں نے کہا کہ اب آپ کو اپنی رائے بدل لینی چاہیے مگر مان خدا تعالی ایسے سامان پیدا کرتا رہا, رہا کہ مجھے اپنی رائے میں تبدیل تبدیلی کی ضرورت محسوس نہ ہو یہ آئی بیس مائی پولیٹیکل اسٹینس آن دا ہولی قرآن اینڈ آئی ڈونٹ فائنڈ اینی نیڈ ٹو چینج مائی اسٹینس ونس آئی ڈو دس یہ سیٹ دیر واز اے ٹائم وین اے سچویشن ہیڈ گون ساؤتھ اسٹینس آئی ہیڈ ٹیکن دا ایگزیکٹ آپوزٹ اروز And people became so concerned that they came to me and asked me, please change your stance in this new political world. And he said, by the grace of God, I did not have to. And eventually the tides turned back in favor of my stance because my stance was based on the Holy Quran. I'll briefly give you two examples of political unrest that existed at his time and how he spoke up against and I'll be very brief there's a book Swane Fazli Umar it's the biography of Hazrat Muslim Maud and there's a great detail there and you're more than welcome to read it but here one is about Kashmir there was an instance in which Hazrat Muslim Maud had declared that based on the different aspects that he had set into play for the people of Kashmir things would settle down and things would be great Improvement is on the rise. He said, the moment I had said this in a Friday sermon, three days later, an uprising and chaos erupted in Kashmir. Immediately, people were like, no, what you said three days ago, you have to take that stance back. 
You have to speak up. You have to say, no, you were wrong. As a Muslim said, it was 30 days of great darkness. But I did not change my stance. I held true to what I had said because I knew inevitably it would come to fruition based on the different work that he had done based on the Holy Quran. And then he told his Jamaat, he said, this is a test. It's a test for you and it's a test for me. Watch how Allah will change the tide. And he says, 30 days had passed. Everything settled down and people had completely forgotten that the uprising even occurred. He said, but I knew. The second one is about Turkey. In 1919, on September 21st, France and England met at Brussels to talk about the fate of Turkey. At the exact same time, there was an invitation in Lucknow in India where they would have an entire function to talk about the fate of Turkey. Hazrat Muslim Rauzitana stepped forward, joined this program, even wrote an address called The Future of Turkey. And he had Hazrat Maulvi Sher Ali read out this address. He laid out exactly what needed to be done. And one of the basic elements was that the Muslim world should unite for the future of Turkey. What happens next? Now, of course, the Muslim world didn't unite as usual, unfortunately. Things become sour, become worse. So much so that now June of the following year, on June 1st, they decide to hold another conference to settle the matter of Turkey. And they knew that if they had informed Hazrat Muslim world early enough, he would probably write something and send something in. So they only told him the night before, on the 30th of May, please attend this function tomorrow. Alhamdulillah, Hazrat Muslim Maud spent the whole night and wrote an address called the Pact of Turkey. It was read out, and again, he reminded them. He said, I told you, if and only if the Muslim world had united, Today, Turkey's situation would not have become like it is today. These are different examples of Hazrat Muslim in his very life, speaking truth to power, creating that lasting change, bringing issues in the forefront. And today, the Ahmadiyya Muslim community is continuing that as well. Just about Gaza alone, you did not know this, as a Khalifatul Masih al Khamis, Ayyid al Minister Aziz, organized a summit in Israel at our very mosque early on when this, these atrocities had just begun. He invited Jews and Muslims together in a mosque to talk about the way forward. This was held under the direction of Hazrat Khalifa al-Masih, but he did not stop there. Immediately after this, he announced a campaign called Voices for Peace. And the objective was Let's get all of those voices around the world to speak up for peace. That may create some change in this political world. That may influence some of these politicians to make the right decision. And not only that, he is the only Muslim leader in the world that has consistently, every week, spoken about the injustices. And let me paint a picture for you. If you're on YouTube or Instagram and you speak against Israel, what happens? Most often than not, your channel gets banned, you get flagged, and yet all of Hazur's clips are found in all of these social media platforms, very clearly and directly speaking up against the reality of the injustices and the oppressors. Similarly, Capitol Hill recently, he sent the Emir of Kababir. Kababir is found in Israel itself. He sent him to go and meet some of the high you know, political officials of America to get them to understand the need of a ceasefire. Recently, he had an interview with a politician in UK. The moment he walked in, the first thing Azur said to the politician was, you people are scared of saying the word ceasefire. And the politician immediately replied, no, no, Azur, I did say the word ceasefire. He said, yeah, but the rest of your party hasn't. This is how forthcoming and outright your beloved Hazrat Khalifa al Masih is. And of course, above all, and this is just the fifth one I'm sharing, there's probably countless other efforts that are happening 
Because again, the light of hope is in Ahmadiyyat. Hazur has sent doctors. Humanity First is on the ground in Gaza. A circular was shared that if you want to donate, donate to Humanity First. 98 cents of the dollar goes directly to the people in need. If you really want to help, the drink that you save by not buying from Starbucks, put that money towards the doctors that are on the ground in Gaza. That's more meaningful. And in this way, following the example of Hazrat Muslim and the example of our Hazrat Khalifa al Masih, with prayers, with awareness, and with consistency, I hope and pray that we can follow this example, join that spiritual army to create lasting peace. Amen. Now, um, um, in our program, we have a question and answer session. So if you have any question, please uh, um, come to the podium or you can speak loud. Or your video team should have a... Assalamualaikum. This is Saud Khan. Uh, the speech given by the Tait Sab was very informative. Uh, in fact, me being in Qadian and all that has forgotten a lot of things. You brought up a good subject of those 10 uh, Hindu uh, people who put an application against the whole nine yard. Could you, do you happen to have the names of those Hindus? Is it a part of the history? We can research or something like that. That'll be great. I'm sorry. So because of lack of time, I cut their names out. Uh, but you can find there's a speech uh, given by, uh, I can't remember the name, but you can find all names of these 10 Hindus in uh, one of the speeches of Jalsa in 1958 in Qadian. So you can find that information there. Musab, can you also uh, explain to all of us in the prophecy when uh, it's mentioned you'll convert three into four, what does really that mean? Assalamu alaikum. The question was, can we explain in the prophecy it says he will make three into four. And the promised Messiah when reading this part of the prophecy he said, I'm not sure what it means. And there's great wisdom in his comment there because as a Muslim mentioned that there are many instances in which this has been fulfilled in different ways. One example is that as you all may know there were a total of four sons that lived in the life of Hazrat Muslim Total of five sons, one had already passed away before the promised Messiah salam, claimed to be the Messiah. Out of the four, only three were Ahmadis. One was not, Mirza Sultan Ahmad, who was the son of the first wife of the promised Messiah. Salam. So it was during Hazrat Muslim Allah's time that Mirza Sultan Ahmad had the courage, I guess, to finally take that leap of faith and he joined Ahmadiyya. He in fact describes, he said, in the life of the promised Messiah, I thought about joining, but I was reluctant and I missed the chance. Then Khalifa Awwal was there and I again thought of joining. Again, I missed the chance, I was reluctant. And now at this time, I will come and join Islam Ahmadiyyat. So in this way, he turned three into four. 
But there are other examples of that as well that has been fulfilled. And we can look into that, but like I said, it's a consistent, um, one of those prophecies that's not identified on purpose so that it can be fulfilled in many ways. I hope that helps. Anybody have a question on this? Uh... There is a mic, so they'll bring you the mic. You just have to stand up. Over there. Can you get the mic? Mubarak sahab, ladies have a mic as well? Salam alaikum. Okay, wa alaikum salam. Um, in the prophecy, it did mention that his name would be Emmanuel and Bashir. I'm kind of confused about why it talks about Emmanuel. What, what is the significance about that name? Good question. I don't have anything on me now as a reference, so I'll get back to you on that. Inshallah. Yeah, My name is Usman. I, I read online that, um, and I don't know if this was talked about earlier, Hazrat Muslim Maud also paved the way for Pakistan, including for the Amity community and also for a Muslim majority state for the liberation of Pakistan from India. Um, could you talk more about this in terms of the efforts and his, um, his efforts for more justice for Muslims and also for Kashmir? Jazakallah, Jazakallah. Um, I was reading just today, actually, as I was preparing for my speech, 1919 was the first time as a Muslim Maud publicly arranged a program where he said that there are 10 states in this Indian subcontinent, five are Muslim majority, five are Hindu majority. Let's make a simple split in the middle, allow a Muslim state to exist among the five majority Muslim and allow a Hindu state to exist among the five majority Hindu. So in 1919 was the first time that he in fact started this conversation about creating a state of Pakistan. And over the years, as we know, that uh, as a Muslim Muslim kept pushing that this idea should occur. Otherwise, he said, if a Muslim state is not made, the Hindus will usurp all of the Muslims' rights and we will not be allowed to preach and have freedom of religion if we don't establish this state now. Similarly, we know that Qaid Azam, the founder of Pakistan, actually pulled out of the idea of going to Congress and speaking up of a creation of another nation. It was Hazrat Muslim Al-Tanah's consistent guidance to the missionary who lived in London that he kept meeting Qaid Azam and saying that you should not stop this, this should continue it. So much so that it was in the London mosque, our mosque, that Qaid Azam made his first speech saying, we will now create a nation called Pakistan. And it was from this wave of effort that Qaid Azam continued to grow and build up this movement. It got to a point when Mullah, or the Muslim clerics of India at the time, started raising against this call for Pakistan and even started using different narratives. For example, they would say, don't call it Pakistan, call it Palidistan, a dirty nation, instead of a Pakistan, a pure nation, or a pure place. And in this way, they consistently pushed against the creation of Pakistan. Now that Pakistan has been created, they try to take all the credit, and now they're going again, making this into what they originally envisioned, a Palidistan, by taking the rights away from minorities or others of, of other faiths. To give you an example, Qaid Azam, when even early on when Pakistan was being created, when they designed the flag, you'll notice there's white and there's green. The green refers to the Muslim majority, but the white refers to minorities. He wanted from day one that we should acknowledge the existence of the minorities, whether they're Hindu or Sikh, and we should not usurp their rights and we should not eliminate them, forcefully preach to them or convert them. These are different, different visions that he had early on um, that are really based on how the Muslim al you know, a vision in the beginning. So I hope that helps. Mike. Uh, okay. We have a question on Zoom. What does Fazli Umar mean? It is also a part of a, the prophecy as well, but basically the essence of it is that he would, he would resemble Hazrat Umar, Khalifatul Rasul, 
in many ways. And that's why he would be Fazl Umar. He would have the, the grace of Hazrat Umar And we see that he, Hazrat Umar was the second Khalifa. So was Hazrat Muslim Much of the advancements, the, the expansion, and a lot of the organizational structure that was introduced by Hazrat Umar likewise was introduced by Hazrat Muslim in his era as well. There's another prophecy of that. Question here. It's not really a question, it's just a request. If you follow the proceedings here and now, we find that um, in view of time, everybody's in a hurry. Is there any way we can have the proceedings here to share it with other people, particularly the lecture by, you know, our respected, you know, missionary, so that others can also benefit from the volume of, the volume and quantity of the, even for those of us who are seated here, reading and reading it will help us to improve our stance. It will also help us to preach to others because the lecture had a lot of pregnant you know, aspects which we need to replenish our brains with. Thank you very much. So I do record uh, this the different session. I think this session is being recorded as well. But separately, I also record mine and, uh, and post it online as well and share it on the WhatsApp group. So I'll do that again, inshallah. I'll make sure to add you on the WhatsApp group so you'll see that message from now, inshallah. It's also being recorded and will be posted on YouTube. It'll also be posted on our YouTube channel, inshallah. It's being recorded. Jazakallah. Any question on the Lajna side, ladies' side? Yeah, the, uh, the ladies' side is preparing. Can anybody have any question here? Anyone, please. Um, just two quick questions. Obviously, uh, our beloved Hazrat Muslim Maud led our Jamaat for almost half a century. Um, has there been any other Muslim leaders that have led a community or even other religions like, like a Pope, for example? That's my first question. Um, my second question, and I apologize, I was late. Was there any mention of the attack that happened on Hazrat Muslim Maud, I believe in March of 1954, and how the Jamaat responded after that? Can you repeat the first question again, if you don't mind? In terms of the duration of Hazrat Muslim Maud's tenure being almost half a century or more than half a century, 50 plus years, um, in, has there been any other religious leaders that have led um, as the single leader of a community? As I mentioned, I could probably find this answer on Google, but it just came to my, my mind right now, whether it's a pope or, or whatnot in another religion. Jazakallah, I actually don't, I can't think of anybody, to be honest. So that may be actually a very good, interesting point to include in a speech next time. So Jazakallah. Uh, the second question was, I, I forgot it, sorry. Oh yes, on the attack, okay. So Hazrat Muslim, um, as we all know, he was uh, you know, always accessible by the people at all times. He consistently had this. In fact, there was no security guards at all um, that were ever really assigned to the safety or security of Hazrat Muslim And it just so happens, and this is a historical uh, side story that you may not know, but in 1948, Hazrat Muslim had asked that America Jamaat should send one new convert of America to come and become a missionary. And Abdur, sorry, Rashid Ahmad American Sahib was assigned or was approved to go. He spent a few years uh, trying to collect enough money to buy the ticket and eventually went. And he became a student of Hazrat Muslim. And so for many years, he attended Jamia and would visit Hazur. And there's video clips of it as well. And he is actually the first official missionary that came to America um, as a missionary. And what's interesting about his story is he had his own practice of praying right behind Hazur every day in that mosque for his own safety. He did it on his own. This was something he would do. He had that you know, inkling that you know, he should make sure that he's there. And he did that consistently while he was in Pakistan with Hazrat Muslim, except one day, the day he was getting married. He couldn't go to the mosque. That is the same day Hazrat Muslim was attacked. So you can just put it in perspective that some things happened. We don't know why they happened, but they could happen for a greater good. 
And we know that after this, an entire security system was established, the Fazil Khas, and so many other elements were put into place for the safety and security of, of the Khulafa. So just a side story I wanted to share with that, with, if anybody had not heard that before, but that was an interesting thing I had learned about. Any question, question here? His son was born, is not, is what? Jazakallah for that clarification. Jazakallah, okay, good. So that's even even better story, actually, Jazakallah. In fact, that night or that day was the day his son was born, so he was not able to go there. And then later it named his son Bashir. There you go, Jazakallah. There is a... Uh... Assalamu alaikum. Are the non MD Muslim, I'm sorry, the non MD Pakistanis aware that uh, uh, Muslim Al took a big part in Pakistan? Yeah, yeah, they're very much aware of it. That's why they deliberately, yeah, they deliberately try to um, undercut some of the uh, you know efforts that we made. For example, all Kashmir committee was created in India, in British India. And the idea was to decide the fate of Kashmir and how to solve their issue of not being here or there, as a Muslim mother was made the chairman of that committee. Additionally, there was a need for people to go in and actually help the Kashmiris. And so as a Muslim mother established a Furqan force, an actual like military force in a way, or a battalion that actually went to protect the people of Kashmir. Additionally, Hazrat Chaudhry uh, Zafullah Khan Saab was the first foreign minister of Pakistan. As I mentioned, London mosque, our own Jamaat was where Qadi Azam announced it. There's so many instances, but historically they will make sure that they remove those from their history books. So many people may not be aware now, but initially it's there and is very clearly recorded. Any other question? Gaffar Sahib has a question over there. Also, I'm expecting ladies should have more questions. They yeah. shouldn't remain quiet. I hope they have questions, inshallah. They sent me, they don't have any questions. No, it cannot be they don't have any questions. Then they were not listening. Yes, sir. Uh, were, were the English speeches of the Muslim Maud written in, in English or were they translated in English? They were translated. Mm -hmm. So so the the one in 1924 by Sarza Okay. G, G, G. He had a basic understanding of English. Uh, he was able to read and write and even speak. Um, but I think most of his addresses were written originally in Urdu and then translated. Uh, uh, in, uh, one of the speeches at uh, the end speech you guys mentioned um, how we're like living in the end times and we're talking about the concept of Gog and Magog. I understand that um, the promised Messiah himself had multiple predictions on that subject and he identified, to my knowledge, the German and the the Russians as being part of those powers. Hazrat Mirza Tyram uh, also identified the Russian and the United States rivalry as being part of that uh, subject. But I was wondering if Hazrat Muslimat, who whose caliphate was through the period of the Second World War and the emergence of the Cold War, which were probably which were um, great conflicts between world powers, also had any thoughts on this kind of subject. I'm so glad that you're that well read. Allah bless you uh, for that. Those who haven't read this yet, the Promised Messiah speaks about Zulkarnain, Cyrus, who was at the time the, the prophet who um, created a barrier in between two great powers called Gog and Magog. And the idea was that he would be the one to protect the believers so that they could continue the mission of the world. While these two, these two you know, world powers can fight and kill each other and, and be done with it. But the idea is in the Quran, it refers to Zulkarnain coming again. And we understand that the promised Messiah was the second coming of Zulkarnain. And that in his era, Gog and Magog would reappear. And when the promised Messiah was asked about the identity of these two nations, who they would be, he in fact identified them as Britain and their allies on one side, and Russia and their allies on the other side. And so the Cold War, for example, is between Russia and America. America is an ally of Britain. And so we consistently see these wars. And any one of these wars, World War III right now, as we're on the brink of it, seems to be a very much similar depiction of that, where we may need to be protected 
and our Khalifa is consistently warning us for the last 20 years what we need to do to safeguard ourselves when communication goes down, when transportation is a problem, when resources aren't coming in, be self-sustaining and so on and so forth, because you never know when this could happen. So a lot of this is all in line, but just for the, I guess, the ease of everybody, Dajjal is a religious force. It's a Christian group that would consistently meddle in political and religious matters. Gog and Magog is strictly the political forces that will create havoc in the world. And so there's different layers for us to understand. Jews would also exist in some prophecies where they would also be uh, involved in various prophecies. So there's different things that would happen at the same exact time, all alluding to the same injustice that we see around us today. One more question here. Okay, this question is from Zoom. Okay. It's uh, from Bilal Rahman, nine years old. Did Hazrat Muslim Mo do anything in politics during World War II? Say that one more time, sorry. Did Hazrat Muslim Mo do anything politically during World War II? <clears throat> Trying to recall if I read anything specifically. Yeah, there were instances where he was involved. Um, as I mentioned already, if there was ever an instance to be involved, it was something related to the faith, right? So it wasn't just because World War II is happening, the world is killing itself, what was he doing? There were instances, I can't think of anything at the top of my mind from the research I did the last few days, but if something comes up, I can share that. Assalamu alaikum wa alaikum salam. I just want to seize my, I mean, this opportunity to mention something which I think is very important for our Jamaat. See, there was this drive for lost by art, you know, trying to get, you know, lost by art. Um, about five years ago or so, I remember um, I was in Chicago and there was this um, Ahmadi brother who studied in Cairo, very knowledgeable in Arabic, fluent, a good preacher, and, you know, somebody who conveys the message. Now, I asked after him and he stays about um, 200 meters away from the mosque. And I tried to urge our brethren there that we should go after him. They even took me to about um, less than 100 meters to his house. But you know the system here, yeah, you can't just go and. I talked to him on phone from the resident of one of our Amadi brothers, you know, that I'm just a stone throw away. And he just, you know, cut off the phone. Then I urged some of our brethren in Chicago to go after him. And I just discovered that. They were not particularly, you know, willing. And I felt bad because I think um, this drive for for swans of lost by heart involves that we should break barriers. Yes, yes. You know, yes. if for instance I come to, I mean, California now and I ask after our distinguished um, missionary or Brother Noor here, and they said, we've not seen him for some time. Maybe because of my own background from where I'm coming. I have that tendency, I want to get out to him, I want to reach out to him. But there's reluctance, and I don't think that, because when you follow the trend of, you know, what the Muslim Ahud was doing yeah. with regards to reaching out, even in political issues, yeah. we find that in pursuance of ensuring that our brethren also who are weak in faith are brought back, yeah. we'll need to break barriers. Yes. And I think this is very important for should I say the American Jamaat? We should learn to break barriers. Forget about all these um, strict, um, you know, principles that will not help the growth of the Jamaat. I know that um, Brother Ibrahim Naim, respected Ibrahim Naim, also is always on um, tablik. But I think that this is part of what the tablik should be considering. Yeah. In, you know, bringing back bayat, we need to break barriers and get to reach our brethren. It's just, I'm just mentioning it because I know you can do better. You know what I'm saying. Jazakallah. Just to reiterate, so he's mentioning that beloved Hazur has in fact many times, especially on our centenary, the letter that was sent to USA Jamaat for the next cent cent, you know, century, the guidance was there that we should go back and find the lost souls of Ahmadiyyat. Let's say somebody converted 100 years ago, they have kids and their grandkids and find out who they are, where they are. And this re responsibility was not placed on just a few office holders. Azur said this in an address to all USA members. Each and every one of us should make an effort. One way to do it is 
you and I know of the last 10 years, many converts who have joined, you may not see them anymore. You may have their contact on your phone. Give them a call. Ask them how they're doing. Where are they? How's life? Don't in, you know, interrogate them and don't be rude, but in a loving manner, you want to meet them somewhere outside. Make that effort. And that's what he's referring to. Break those barriers. Because if we keep sitting complacent, we're going to become, we're going to start losing more and more people, even our own members. Additionally, I remember an incident that happened. This is in 2016. Um, we had a, uh, a USA delegation during Jalsa Salana UK. We all went there. And we were allowed into the room as well um, as missionaries. So we we're all sitting there and observing Azur's interaction with all the USA delegates. And it was very lovely and very lively. And then somebody from Philadelphia got up and said, Azur, we have a gift for you. I said, okay, what is the gift? And he pulled out like a picture frame and a picture. He said, this is a picture of all of the, the early converts of Philadelphia. And we saw visibly on Hazur's face. He looked away, not towards it, but looked away. And said, so what am I going to do with the picture? Bring me those people back. I don't need the picture. I need you to go and find those people. <clears throat> find those people and bring them back. What good is a picture, a historical picture going to do me? And that is exactly where, that's 2016. 2020, we heard it again. Then recently in our, you know, the last, I think it was address that Hazur sent as a message to USA Jamaat in the National Jalsa, Again, as we repeated it, go and find those lost souls. So it's not impossible. Many of you can do it on your own. Go to Ancestry.com, start putting in names, numbers, you'll start finding people. So let's all make it kind of our own drive to start identifying those people. Thank you. Yeah, here. Oh, just to make um, Sahib, um, I know. Okay. So I know Hazur already clarified this is not a birthday, but still we are celebrating today. And my understanding is it's a truthfulness of Islam and promise Messiah. Just to clarify, can we take it as a Shukar uh, part to be thankful to God for the fulfillment of prophecy. And that's why we are celebrating. That is the only reason we're celebrating. We should not take it that way. We, that is why we take it. We take it as a thankfulness to God. The prophecy was read out on 20th February. That's why we're here 20th February. He was born on 12th January. So we don't. It's not a birthday in any way or form. It is a thankfulness to God, reflecting on God's existence, the proof of God's existence. It's all about God in this sense. Yeah. Because I was one of them. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I stopped coming for a while, you know, and he used to write letters to me. Yeah. And he used to call me. So I just wanted to make that point. Pictures, yeah, you can show pictures, but at the same time, you got to talk to those people and you got to bring it, right? If you know any of them. So I just wanted to make that point. Exactly. And Imam Khosal was exactly. really good at that. Exactly. Please join me in silent prayer. Dua. Amin. Allah Amin. 